Good afternoon, uh, Father Peter Damien from St. Paul the Apostle. I'm going to wait for a couple of minutes until uh, others uh, may join us. Kathy. Good afternoon to those who are joining us right now. Hello, Mary Jo. I see Mary Jo and Kathy are watching. <clears throat> Michelle, hello, welcome. Let's start with uh, the Regina Celli prayer, which is uh, the instead of the Angelus prayer that is recited during the Easter season. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Queen of heaven, rejoice, alleluia, for he whom you did marry to bear, alleluia, has risen as he said, alleluia, pray for us to God, alleluia. Rejoice and be glad, O Virgin Mary, alleluia, for the Lord is truly risen, alleluia. Let us pray. O God, who gave joy to the world through the resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, grant we beseech you that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, his mother, we may obtain the joys of everlasting life through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, Pam and Mary. Uh, happy Easter Sunday. Divine Mercy Sunday is still Easter. It's the last day of the octave of Easter. And um, we had just finished uh, celebrating Mass at church earlier um, and with Deacon Michael. So I'm switching gears now, going to into the catechesis from Mass into the um, Our Space Salvi uh, reading. Uh, today we're going to focus on the true shape of Christian hope, and that is um, that is from paragraph 24 until 30th. Um, it is another great read. Uh, yesterday, yesterday was uh, was a long one, and I went all the way through it. Um, and just summarized at the end because um, it was um, it was important to, to keep going. And um, today, um, very much um, these paragraphs that we're going to read, 24th through 30th, are building upon uh, what we um, what we read today yesterday. Um, so, um, but it focuses more on um, on the uh, characteristics of Christian hope. Um, after going into that reflection about the historical evolution of, um, of thought, um, uh, so in regards to a philosophy, in regards to philosophical, uh, to um, uh, philosophy of politics and um, science, and um, and and how how we came through various uh, thinkers and politicians of the 19th and 20th century, how how we we got where we got today. Um, so um, now I'm going to, uh, to read about the true shape of Christian hope. So, paragraph 24. Let us ask once again, what may we hope and what may we not hope? First of all, we must acknowledge that incremental progress is possible only in the material sphere. So here's, here's a positum. Uh, you know, it's just Pope Benedict is building upon this, um, this statement that incremental progress is possible only in the material sphere. And he explains, Here, amid our growing knowledge of the structure of matter, and in the light of ever more advanced inventions, we clearly see continuous progress toward an ever greater, master, uh, an ever greater mastery of nature. Um, yet in the field of ethical awareness and moral decision-making, there is no similar, similar possibility of accumulation for the simple reason that man's freedom is always new and he must always make his decisions anew. 
So there's a, there's a difference here between the, the, um, the material um, world and, um, um, and what's, uh, what's under the moral responsibility of, of man. So there is material progress. Uh, <clears throat> there is material progress in the, um, in, in the uh, material sphere. So think about the inventions. Um, and, um, and, and the laws that we came, or the laws of nature that we come to understand deeper and deeper. Um, but it is not so in the material sphere. So he says, um, in the field of ethical awareness and moral decision making, there is no similar possibility of accumulation for the simple reason that man's freedom is always new and he must always make his decisions anew. So, <clears throat> these decisions can never simply be made for us in advance by others. If that were the case, we would no longer be free. Freedom presupposes that in fundamental decisions, every person and every generation is a new beginning. Naturally, new generations can build on the knowledge and experience of those who went before, and they can draw upon the moral treasury of the whole humanity. But they can also reject it because it can never be self-evident in the same way as material inventions. The moral treasury of humanity is not readily at hand like tools that we use. It is present as an appeal to freedom and a possibility for it. So you see the clear, the clear difference here between the laws the, of, of the matter, the physical laws, and, um, and, and science, uh, where um, there's continuous progress because of the deeper understanding, but that is not true about uh, when it comes to ethical awareness and moral decision making. We can um, we're we're not the same. Today we can make a I can make a good choice about something, and tomorrow I can um, I can uh, make a, a bad choice, um, or even today. So you know we we're we are not the same. Uh, it's it's we're different than matter. We we have um, as humans as human beings um, we, we we have the the ability to choose and we have a will and we have um, uh, freedom. So that's that's the important um, um, the important aspect to catch here. Uh, it's the um, uh, the dynamic nature of freedom and how it can influence our um, our uh, our progress. Um, or, or regressing, right? Or regress. So, um, <clears throat> so this means this, however, means that, and there are two, um, there are two other, um, two areas where Pope Benedict explains uh, what he just said. This means that a the right state of human affairs, the moral well-being of the world, can never be guaranteed simply through structures alone however good they are. Such structures are not only important, but necessary, yet they cannot and must not marginalize human freedom. Even the best structures function only when the community is animated by convictions capable of motivating people to assent freely to the social order. Freedom requires conviction. Conviction does not exist on its own, but must always be gained anew by the community. So that is A. And B, since man always remains free and since his freedom is always fragile, the kingdom of God will never be definitively established in this world. This is another important statement. Anyone who promises the better world that is guaranteed to last forever is making a false promise. He is overlooking fr human freedom. Freedom must constantly be won over for the cause of good. Free ascent to the good never exists simply by itself. If there were structures which could irrevocably guarantee a determined good state of the world, man's freedom would be denied. And hence, they would not be good structures at all. So these two points that he makes, A and B, are that structures alone are not sufficient to guarantee that what's happening in the world is progress. They are, not, they are important and necessary, but they cannot 
take the place that is on, that is um, that only human freedom can have. So um, so uh, structures, and he's referring here to social structures. Um, st social structures are important. Order is important, but um, there cannot be true social order without freedom. Um, and and freedom is something that that is not static. It has to be gained ever new by the community. And the second point he makes here is that um, um, is that the kingdom of good, because of this, because the freedom freedom is dynamic, can never be established for good in the world. Um, so kind of the idea of heaven and earth, uh, you know, is is, is not possible um, because until we are in the world, um, the world is determined by by the choices, by our free choices, um, and 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 that is um, um, we, we would be requiring of the world something that is not possible uh, to obtain in this world. So, um, and and he makes here a, a, an, an an interesting point in the end of um, of point B. He says, "Free assent to the good never exists simply by itself. If there were structures which could irrevocably guarantee a determined good state of the world, man's freedom would be denied, and hence they would not be good structures at all." So, someone who's who's pretending to by force to institute the good um, would would fail because it would be going against freedom. So that so therefore, this good that is being pursued. Is wrong, and just just think about just think about what we're going through. Our questions about right now um, uh, the implications of what we're we're living, and um, we're wondering about our freedom and um, how we need to have so good social structures that need to step in and occur in the case of emergency like this, like a pandemic. But at the same time, how important it is to to preserve human freedom and how human freedom is, is necessary, right? Um, something that would be imposed only by, um, from above, um, by governments or by courts, um, you know, that, that we wouldn't say that the end of this would be a perfect society, right? It, there needs to be a collaboration, dynamic collaboration between um, uh, civil and juridical authority and ecclesiastical authority too. That's, that's true also for, for the way the church exists but also the freedom of the individual and of the communities. Um, otherwise, even, even imposing good things upon others, um, the outcome is not good, um, is, um, is actually the opposite of good. The, this wouldn't be a good social structure. So, um, paragraph 25. What this means is that every generation has the task of engaging anew in the arduous search for the right way to order human affairs. This task is never simply completed. Yet every generation must also make its own contribution to establishing convincing, convincing structures of freedom and of good, which can help the following generation as a guideline for the proper use of human freedom. Hence, always within human limits, they provide a certain guarantee also for the future. In other words, and here's, here's a conclusion of this whole reasoning, Good structures help, but on themselves, they are not enough. Good structures help, but of themselves, they are not enough. Man can never be redeemed simply from outside. Francis Bacon and those who followed in the intellectual current of modernity that he inspired were wrong to believe that man would be redeemed through science. So we heard yesterday in our reading, a critique, uh, uh, a deep critique of uh, Karl Marx. Um, today we see here in paragraph 25, a deep critique, another deep critique of, um, of the philosophers of the modern era, um, Francis Bacon particularly. So man cannot be redeemed through science. Um, such an expectation asks too much of science. This kind of hope is deceptive. Science can contribute greatly to, man, to making the world and man, mankind more human, yet it can also destroy mankind and the world unless, unless it is steered by forces that lie outside it. So, think about, we, we all realize how science 
and the progress obtained through science can be used in a good or in a bad way, right? So science alone is not sufficient to redeem man, so to speak, to give humanity the, the, the hope and the, and the, and the blessedness, the, the happiness that we all search for. Um, science cannot give that, um, politics cannot give that, entertainment cannot give that. So um, that, that's, that's important to, um, to, to, to consider. Um, so this kind of hope put in the wrong place demands too much of the things of this world, right? Um, I often I often say um, to to couples in marriage prep and sometimes even on on um, in the homily at the wedding, if you expect from your husband or from your wife to make you perfectly happy, you're expecting something wrong from the other because the other one is a human, is a human being, and therefore unable hundred percent to fulfill the other, unable hundred percent to. Um, unable 100% to make you happy. There, there's brokenness in us. Even, even when we have the best intentions for, for others, um, there's, we're, we're broken human beings. We need redemption. We are not God. So only God can make us 100% happy. No human being, and I'm not saying this you know, to say that human beings are not important in making one, one another happy. We are important, but we cannot make anyone 100% happy because we are not God. Science and scientific discoveries are beautiful things. I, I one of my, uh, you know that, that I enjoy flying when I can. I haven't been in a while, and especially now under the, the current uh, uh, shelter in place order, I cannot do that. Um, but, you know, I, I love the progress that, you know, only we humans in the last um, 100 years and something can, can fly. Right. Um, and, 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 and I love it. I enjoy it. Right. We all benefit from science. I'm, I'm speaking in front of a, in front of an iPhone right now and we have Internet and we have, you know, I'm reading uh, I'm reading from an iPad um, while, um, you know, this this encyclical with you. Um, I live streamed mass uh, right um, right before before this. Um, so there's so many good things that come to us because of science and through scientific progress. But science alone cannot make us happy, right? And we see this when, um, when, when people dwell only on, live their lives on, on, you know, social media. And, you know, we, one of the struggles of this time is, is the dependency from, um, certain dependency from technology, how we can kind of become dependent on, uh, on it um, and addicted to it. Um, you know, there, there, there's harm. But that harm is not because of, of, of science. It's, it's because of our, our the, the way we are. We humans are like, we, every day, every moment, our freedom needs to be engaged and we have to make choices how, how to use it, right? So that's true about individuals, that's true about society. So you see how, how nothing of this world by itself can make us fully happy and give us that, that solid hope that um, that we need. So I'm going here into the paragraph 26 paragraph. Um, and this is another, it is so beautiful how Pope Benedict says it. He says, it is not science that redeems man. Man is redeemed by love. Man is redeemed by love. This applies even in terms of this present world. When someone has the experience of a great love in his life, this is a moment of redemption, which gives a new meaning to his life. Just think about this. When someone has the experience of a great love in his life, this is a moment of redemption, which gives a new meaning to his life. But soon he will also realize that the love bestowed upon him cannot by itself resolve the question of his life. That's exactly what I was saying before. No human can make the other happy 100% because only God can do that. Only divine love can do that. Um, it is a love that remains fragile. It can be destroyed by death, right? Um, you know, I, I, I've seen, I've seen um, 
couples who have, uh, whether they lived a short life or a long life together, um, some were so heartbroken and could never, could never overcome the grief of losing one another um, to the point of, of becoming, uh, becoming mentally, um, uh, mentally sick, uh, mentally ill. Um, and on one side, that's a beautiful sign because it means that there was really love. But on the other side, it makes us question and, and wonder, did we put in another human being all our happiness and all our focus and all our attention? Um, and if, if you think I'm, I'm too harsh in saying this, I don't think I am, um, but just read scripture. Um, it's, um, it's in the book of Sirach. Um, I don't have the exact verse here, but it says, cursed is the man who puts his trust in another man. And by this scripture means 100%. You put your, your trust in, in another person like it's God. And only we can trust only God 100%, right? So if we put all our hope, all our trust, all, all our happiness on, you know, in one human being or more human beings or, or, or in things, in stuff, you know, then, then scripture says, cursed is that man. Cursed in the sense that, that, that we did something wrong and we will reap the consequences of that. So, so let's not do that, right? Pope Benedict says here, love, human love remains fragile. It can be destroyed by death. The human beings needs unconditional love. He needs the certainty which makes him say, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you recognize this. This is, this is a quote from Romans 8, 38 to 39. Um, so St. Paul says, Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But why nothing can separate us from the love of Christ? Because Christ's love is perfect. It's the most stable um, reality that we can, we can establish the foundation of our lives, right? Um, if we establish our happiness and our hope on something that cannot give it to us, then, uh, then, 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 then we're going to suffer because of that, right? And it would be unfair to demand to demand of others, whether it is science, whether it is things, whether it is other human beings, even the most the closest to us, um, it would be unfair to expect of them what they cannot give us, what only God can give us. So, um, so Pope Benedict continues here: If this absolute love exists with its absolute certainty, then, then, only then is man redeemed whatever should happen to him in his particular circumstances. This is what it meant to, what it means to say, Jesus Christ has redeemed us, right? See, when, when we talk about Christ as redeemer, uh, and, and we say this, um, it, it meant to a lot of people and to us Christians, even as we believe, uh, sometimes um, we, we, we stay at a risk to stay at a superficial level uh, when we think about um, when we think about um, about what what Christ as Redeemer means, what, um, what 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 redemption are we talking about? Right? This is just freedom from sin, freedom from you know. It, it it's important that so we we are seeing here through uh, through this reflection on just on one encyclical, which is one of the many many uh, teachings of the Church. We see how. Redemption is deeper than we think. Um, it acquires new meaning. So, through Him, through Jesus Christ, we have become certain of God. A God who is not a remote first cause of the world, uh, because His only begotten Son has become man, and of Him everyone can say, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. That's a quote from St. Paul. St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. So 
Um, God is not just a remote first cause of the world. This is, this is another idea, modern idea, um, that yes, God exists, um, so we, we, call that, we call that deism. Um, I believe in God, but a God that is only like set the world in motion and gave laws, um, um, like, a, like a clockmaker, um, he, he created the clock and got it started, and that's about it. And then the clock functions on itself. That's not the God of Jesus Christ. That's not the Christian God that we're talking about. That's deism. That's what it's called. Um, so that it, 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 it's true that God is creator. God is the first cause of the world. But it's not just that. Right? We read in today's gospel that Jesus, the risen Jesus, appeared to the apostles and gave them proof of his resurrection. He asked Thomas to touch him, to touch the marks of his nails. And, and to touch him, it's like, see, it is me. It is truly me. So think about this. This is, this, this is God, God himself who comes into the world and reveals himself, right? And you can, they could not deny that reality. That was the reality that changed their lives, right? Until then, they believed through miracles and through Jesus' teachings, they believed that he was the son of God. But when he rose, from the dead, he, he, they, they were taken to a totally new, new level in their, in their faith. And, 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 and they, they have seen how real um, all this is. So, so that's why Pope Benedict says, through him, through Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us, we have become certain of God. A God who is, because his only begotten son has become man. And of him, everyone can say, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's St. That's Paul's, how he described his whole life. A life of faith, faith in the Son of God. And his whole life was about faith. And because he realized how much Jesus loved him, God loved him, and God loved him in giving himself for, for him. So um, I'm tempted. I'm tempted to go to go deeper, um, but I think it's enough for today. So I will stop here, um, and and tomorrow I will go forward uh, from uh, from verse twenty seven um, forward to uh, to thirtieth, thirty first actually. Yes. So tomorrow I'm going. I'm going into. Um, read a big chunk again if you have any questions um, please uh, please write them down here I'm going to go through your uh, comments to see if there are any questions or any remarks um, Amy says uh, timeless words of wisdom to ponder with the Holy Spirit absolutely there's so much uh, there's so much uh, good out there that we can learn, um, and, and especially in this time, um, uh, as we're all um, uh, we're, we're we're all at home, and it's it's uh, it's so important if we can if we have some time on our hand to use it well and to deepen our knowledge of of uh, of our faith. Um, Kathy says, "Lots to ponder today." Yeah, there are there's a lot to ponder today. Um, but isn't this as it, just just ponder this? Just think about this. When when some people say that that think that the faith and Christian faith is is pretty much superficial, superficial and believing in myths and all kinds of stories. When you when you read something like this, you realize how it all comes together. How how faith is needed and how faith is deep. And we're talking here about philosophy. We're talking here about science. We're talking about here about, about politics in the most beautiful in, in, in the most beautiful way possible. And, and you know, I as priests don't talk much politics, but here's one thing. I, I don't talk about politics as partisanry, political pa partisanry. That, there, there's, there's one kind of politics. And for sure, we do need parties and we do need platforms and we do need... Uh, pe people, uh, you know, to, to, to engage in debates and all that. That's not my part as a priest to go into, right? 
Um, I do have my private convictions, even politically, and I try to make them based on info information and research and all that. But there's pol that politics means um, means the love of the city, the love of for good, or the good of the city, for the good of society. So here we, we Pope Benedict talks about politics and and how that um, are, are these politics um, really um, um, becoming God and taking over every aspect of our lives and promising us um, happiness, full happiness here on earth. Um, no, that's not right to expect of politics. And how important it is, and Pope Benedict here says in various uh, ways, how important it is for politics to respect, to respect um, the, the, the rights of the individual and of, of, of the communities, of society, and freedom, and to foster freedom, how nothing can substitute that. Right? If the world could be governed just by, just by laws and, um, and, you know, the more laws, the better, um, governing every single aspect of our lives. Like, we're not machines, we're humans, right? So appealing to, the, to human freedom um, and, and um, appealing to the responsibility of, of humans and educating ourselves. This is how we grow as a society. We become more mature. We become more, um, we, we, build, we build up society, right? While we, our, our final goal is heaven and the blessedness that God promises us fully in heaven with him, um, we, we, we also transform literally and in a good way this world we live in, which we love. Right? But we know that we're not meant to be here for eternity. Right? So uh, the fact that we're limited, the fact that even our good intentions can do only so much. Um, Pope Benedict here says, says that, um, that, that we, you know, um, human, human uh, love is, is um, fragile. Right? Um, there's, there's an end to it, um, at least the, the, the earthly part of it. You know, and and um, so, you know, it, it's um, we 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 need we need all all this together for the good of the um, for our final goal, and that is the happiness in heaven, and for our earthly um, um, earthly life, uh, which we hope and pray and try to do our best that um, it is fully according to uh, to the good that is revealed to us by God. So. I hope you enjoyed this part and uh, join me tomorrow at uh, noon. Tomorrow I will try to, to stay with, with noon. Today I was not able to. Uh, so join me tomorrow at noon. I will continue to, to discuss about the Christian hope. Um, and at 3 o'clock, Deacon Michael is going to conclude uh, the Divine Mercy Novena and, um, and Chaplet. So God bless you and I look forward to meeting with you tomorrow. Bye-bye.